So, um, for those of you who who know me well, um, I've been trying to resolve some of the questions around seagrass taxonomy since about the third month of my PhD, which I started to to look at the evolution of Australian seagrasses, and I was reading some publications, including the incredible work of of Den Hartog, and there was stuff that didn't make sense to me. And ever since then, um, me, the group that I work with, many of my colleagues and collaborators, who are a lot of you in the room, and a whole bunch of people around the world have been trying to grapple with what I now know is one of the more difficult challenges in flowering plant taxonomy. That is what a species is when you're a seagrass. It's not a trivial matter and I hope by taking you through the, the um, one big example and, and some uh, theoretical, um, more practical operational issues, it'll make a bit more sense. Um, if you get really stuck, stop me because particularly when I'm explaining a couple of the um, background around how taxonomy works, I'd, I'd really like you to understand before we move on because some of the assumptions that we make about how taxonomy works and certainly what came up in the IUCN discussion with Brooke on Monday night um, really struck me that there, there are a few too many assumptions being made about what control we have, which is, I'll tell you now, nothing. Uh, but we can do some research and change the situation if we decide we need to. So hopefully I will, that'll all make sense at the end. Um, Paul, are you here? No. Oh, I'll put this photo in just for Paul. Not that Paul, the other Paul. <laughs> Paul Eftermeyer. This is Paul Eftermeyer Meyer and I down in the Coorong trying to work out what the expletive of species of, um, as it turns out, something now called Althenia, then called Lepolina, um, is occurring down in that region. It turns out there's several probably new species which are these hypersaline adapted um, uh, sort of settled water species, but it's, it's, it was a really good lesson for me because, you know, Paul and I have worked all over the world and we were, you know, getting really into, they were flowering and there was all these things and we had everything in front of us and yet we still weren't confident and so that was a, a useful object lesson. And one of the issues with seagrass taxonomy is we often try to do it without the benefit of reproductive structures. Now this is the very lovely um, emerging flower of something that's called Rupia tuberosa. It's, um, it's very distinctive, it's a very discrete set of characters that you can look at and see, and so it can be quite useful in taxonomy. But why, what is, what is the gnarly problem? The gnarly problem is seagrass taxonomy, we struggle with it basically because seagrasses have evolved to be adapted to a wide range, sorry, a range of highly stringent environmental constraints. And they've evolved to do that after they evolved to live on the land. Okay? So going back into the ocean after around 300 million years of learning to live on the land is actually a really big problem that these plants have overcome and they've done it in a remarkable set of ways we all work on many of those ways, but if you think about how that translates into what might end up as species, we, we have a few issues. We also tend to forget that although it is around 100 million years that, that seagrasses have been evolving from the earliest ancestors into the ocean, um, it's a relatively new place. Um, and the reason I say that is if we think about this little uh, model of the evolution of, um, of the plants that we call seagrasses. They come out of the lineages that evolved into what are now conifers and flowering plants. They are one of the earliest diverging branches of the monocotyledons. Okay? So the desire to go back and occupy the ocean 
was something that was very early on in the evolution of the flowering plants in general, but in particular the monocots. And, and the, the dating work, which I'll show in a minute, is, is quite clear on that. There are multiple lineages of seagrasses. This is the easy to read version, but you can't read it because it seems to be a bit faint. But the coloured lines are the independent lineages. And the reason we call them independent lineages is that the seagrass biological habit, so it's not a phylogenetic group, it's a set of constraints that we've decided we're going to focus on, occurs in multiple lineages. So, see if I can get this thing working. We've got this group here, the Zosteraceae. Um, we've got this group here, which is the what I've called here the marine potamogeetonaceae, so the Althenias, basically Xanachelia related, used to be Lepalina, a whole bunch of species in temperate Australia. We have the lineage that includes Cymodoceaceae, Posidoniaceae and Rupiaceae and they are um, one lineage. And then we have the really cool ones over here in the marine Hydrocaritaceae. Now, as you'll see, this divergence time is quite deep. And so trying to compare things that Thalassia and Halus and Holophila do with the rest of this group is, it's like comparing, you know, very, very widely diverged lineages. So there are many, many things about this group that are really different to this group, okay? Um, and in my mind, I'm starting to feel this sort of trend towards recognising that this two lineage um, divergence is where the majority of the significant marine adaptations have occurred. This is my pretty picture placeholder to remind you all that all of the environments these plants grow in are quite different and they have evolved some pretty remarkable mechanisms to cope, that, cope with that. Our latest thing is things like blue carbon and productivity and a whole bunch of other things. But one of the features of seagrass diversity is evolution has led to very few endemic groups and that's endemic at a regional, bioregional scale um, or a continental scale. Okay, there are actually very few amongst all of the seagrass groups. This is one of them, Amphibolus, which occurs in, in temperate Australia. Um, there are very few others. And that feature is part of the problem. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we had wonderful plans, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a Petty Ralph here. I'm going to say, wow, we had all this great stuff and it crashed my computer. No. Um, what happened was we, we'd, we'd in the middle of generating a new phylogeny based on a whole bunch of um, new types of gene regions. And um, the data is looking really good, it's just not in a tree yet. So this is what I'm presenting, um, which is in the new book that Peter mentioned in his talk, um, the summary of, um, of the current status of seagrass biology. Um, and in that, we've revitalised or refreshed our view of the molecular clock dating of the seagrass lineages based on every bit of data we could get together. And this is a chloroplast tree, so apologies that it's only chloroplast data, but we, we um, had to get as many taxa in the tree as possible. So what are we looking at? We're looking at pretty much, um, these are nearly all monocots, so they're all, um, within that early branching lineage of the flowering plants, that this group here, which for the sake of um, not having an argument, we'll call the Elismatales. Okay, there's, there's some robust discussion in the higher order um, circles as to what to call this group, but it is essentially a monophyletic group. In, within this group, we have our marine hydrocaritaceae I just spoke about, our cymodoceaceae in oranges and red, we've, and then we've got our zosteraceae and our um, 
Zanicelli AC slash Alcinia. So what this does is put some divergence times on the generation of those lineages, the deeper divergence of the lineages. So let's go back to the difference between the hydrocaratase and the rest. So the difference between the green and the rest. So that's at least 100 million year um, divergence time. Okay? Plus or minus whatever this error is, which is probably about, I think, 10 million years here. It's pretty sound at, the, at this level of the tree. So 90 to 110 million years ago, the ancestor of the group that became Posidonia, Amphibola, Cymodocea, Syringodium, Hologely, Rupia, Zostra, Philospadix and Lepolina decided to diverge from the hydrocaratase. Okay? What that means is all of the adaptations we see in this clade have been derived since that time and so there's a whole range of ecophysiological, morphological, um, anatomical and other features which are shared by these plants. For example, filiform pollen, the long elongated pollen is found in this group and the pollen up here um, are spherical pollen with still the next scene in it and the marine, the submerged ones embedded in a mucilage. So, so there's some really cool big differences. There's probably, I was, I was trying to work out from um, some of the other data sets that have been shown whether there's other evidence of say physiological adaptations. There, there probably will be. So this is the base. Within each of these lineages we start to get a sense for how old some of them are. Um, and again, this is chloroplast data, so this is how long ago the chloroplast lineages diverged. Um, nuclear data may show some differences, but we've got here um, at the, the split between um, <coughs> the marine clade, the green ones, and Valisneria and this little Necamandra from India, I think it is, anyone from India and Hydrilla, they're uh, the sister clade to the marine hydrocaratase and um, that happens I don't know, somewhere between <coughs> 45 and 75 million years ago. Um, within here we've got the split of Thalassia and Inhalus happening between 25 and 40 million years ago and then divergences within Holophila. Holophila is a, a reasonably old group as a genus, um, but a lot of the species have evolved more recently in the last probably four to five million years. So we're starting to get a picture. Many of these groups have very deep evolutionary histories. Um, one of the, I, I, I really, <laughs> I actually put in this in for Jill um, because one of the reasons that some of these groups have been studied so much is because of their relationship with iconic species like um, dugongs and I honestly believe we wouldn't know as much as we do about Holophila, for example, if dugongs didn't like to eat it. So um, I, I do applaud the idea that sometimes we have to go for the, um, the iconic factor. So this is the complicated group. It's, it's nearly all of the diversity of seagrasses at the generic level. Um, the, the current circumscription of Cymodociaces is pretty clear, although the relationship between Cymodocea and Syringodium flips around in the chloroplast data, which I suspect is just that they diverged um, relatively closely together. Again, this is chloroplast data, so there's you can see all these overlapping grey bars, that means the resolution isn't great. So, so at this level we don't know who came first and who came second, but essentially Posidonia's sister to Rupia and the rest of the Cymodociaceae. So, so that, that fits with what we, we thought before. Um, the Zostraceae, Philospadix and Zostra, whatever you want to call the genera, um, come out together and then we've got this lone 
beast down here, which here is represented by Xanatelia, but is a Lepulina. There are actually a number of Potamogeton species that grow in quite saline waters. Um, and so, you know, how are we going to deal with those? That's a, another question. So, evolutionary history and distributions has tried to be mapped to this really long-term history of, of the globe. And I, um, I've done it myself, I do it all the time. Oh, you know, the, where, where do the boundaries of the continents occur at different times? Where are extant distributions today? Do they make sense? Well, first of all, I say, now we know long distance dispersal is possible and probably happens more likely than not in many cases, even if it's very rare. Some of these distributions therefore don't actually mean a lot if you're trying to map whether or not Cylomidocea should be found in a particular place. And for example, 30 million years ago, Cylomidocea was found in Florida, for example. The fossils from Florida are superb and there's no question that, that it was there. Um, so how come we lost it, well, why didn't it get back? So you know, these, these sorts of questions come up. But how does that relate to taxonomy? And what is all this DNA evidence telling us? Well, first of all, I think you need to understand the taxonomic process. And I have to say, it's been a very steep learning curve for me, in, particularly in the last eight years since I took over as the head of a taxonomy institution. Um, my assumptions about how a lot of people do taxonomy, which were based in the way I, was, I learned how to do it, are in fact not the way most people do it. Um, and there's two parts to the taxonomic process. One is the development of a classification, okay? which means you take all the variation you see and you try to make sense of it in some way. And then there's the application of nomenclature. And that's the bit which has rules. Okay? The development of classification by any taxonomist has no rules. There's no rule of thumb, there's no percent differences, there's no, you can't publish a species unless there's three new characters, there's no special rules at all. Okay? It's entirely up to you, the taxonomist, to look at all the variation in front of you and decide what you're looking at. Today, we have a huge toolkit at our fingertips to do this. We can have morphology, anatomy, chemistry, molecular characters, which could be DNA, they could be various proteins, they could be biochemical pathways, they could be all sorts of things. Any of those things can be used to generate your taxonomy. But they do have to be inheritable because otherwise they have no meaning in describing an entity. Okay? So this is, this is the, nut, uh, the crux of the problem. They have to be inheritable, the characters that we choose. Um, and when we do define our species concepts, there should be characteristics which are diagnostic. Okay? So you should be able to write the description out and that should be very clearly able to capture the concept you're trying to cover. So let's think about an example, um, the difference between um, Cymodocea and Amphibolus because in many characters they are very, very similar. Um, but the vertical um, stem component and the formation of viviparous seedlings, for example, are diagnostic characters for amphibolus that Cymodocea doesn't have most of the time. So we have actually, you need to be looking for characteristics that are diagnostic. In a modern taxonomy context, so bearing in mind the majority of our species that we use, the concepts we used, were described prior to modern theoretical taxonomic concepts, because a lot of them predate the 1980s. Um, 
where there wasn't necessarily the idea that those taxonomic concepts would reflect shared common ancestry. Today we expect our taxonomic con constructs to reflect the evolution of phylogenetic relationships of um, the species that you're describing. So there's currently in the taxonomic literature a tension between um, traditional, what we re commonly refer to as alpha taxonomy, which is the description of essentially, usually morphological characters or anatomical characters and the cataloguing of those and the putting of descriptions around that to define a species. Today we expect to be able to um, do that but in the context of who's related to who and how different they are to each other. So there, there is some tension there. Now, the tricky bit is what to call it and the rules around that. And this comes back to what we were talking with Brooke about on Monday night, which is why is it appropriate to change zostra to nanozostra, for example? Um, what's the rules around that? So the rules are very, 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 very detailed and they're listed in the International Code of Nomenclature for algae, fungi and plants. And the current code that we work to is the one that was signed off on after the International Botanical Congress in Melbourne, um, the International Botanical Congress in China um, last year, the code is being revised as a result of that. So the code is only revised at the IBC con congresses, which are every five to six years. So major changes to the code only happen that quickly. So if you don't like your acacias being called racospermum, you have to wait that long to put a, a vote to the code <laughs> and to, to change it. Okay. So. Um, what, what on earth is in the code and how does it clarify things for us? So first of all, the botanical code is different to the zoological, bacterial and viral codes. Okay, they have their own. And that's why you can have some names from the zoological world or bacteriological world, and Holophila is one of them, which drives me bonkers, um, that uh, overlap with these other codes. So within the one code there's certain rules and if you're a different code sometimes the, the rules are different. Um, in the botanical code a name is fixed to a type specimen. Okay, what's a type specimen? A type specimen is usually, as it says here, a herbarium specimen, pressed sheet or pickled material that's lodged with a herbarium um, but in a few rare cases it can be um, a photograph. I mean, particularly if the material's been lost. Um, the bombing of the Berlin herbarium meant we lost a lot of type material, for example, but some people had photographs, so there's some preservation of type characteristics that way. Um, the main guiding principle is the name that's applied is the first one published. Okay, so coming back to our nanozostra question, um, the actual name that you have to use under current, the current rules are the first name published for what you're defining as your operational taxonomic group is the oldest one, okay, provided it, it, it matches. Um, and one of the reasons for that is this, is this taxonomy is supposed to be globally relevant. It's supposed to be, you know, we can walk out here and look at one thing and then walk out in Kenya and look at a, 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 the same species and it should have the same name. <coughs> um, each taxon only has one name. So, for example, um, the current situation with the genus in the genus Holophila and the group that I've referred to as the Holophila ovalis complex, there are, I can't remember how many names Christine has come up with, there's more than 20, I think, maybe even more than that, um, various names that have been applied to that group 
some of them validly, some of them invalidly, some of them um, without actually knowing what the, they belong to. Um, so there's all these names that, that belong to the same group. And the only way of working through it is to go back to the types and looking at the characters and then doing the description and diagnosis to work it out. So, so the, that process is quite formal okay? and it follows these rules. And the idea is that the taxonomic name, the scientific name, is this identifier. It's, it's, it's unique or it should be. Um, the names are treated as Latin. So the genus and the species name, the way we talk about them, the way we refer to them is, is Latin. Um, and until the Melbourne Code, your diagnosis description had to be in Latin. Since the Melbourne Code, so since 2011, we've been able to publish the diagnosis in English and there's current discussions about other languages but at the moment it's English and Latin are the two options for you to write your diagnosis. And these rules are retrospective. Uh, basically they apply to everything that's gone behind as well as forward. <coughs> so what does this mean for um, the take home message for how we can work in understanding seagrass taxonomy? Um, what is a species is based on what the author describes and the type specimen they link it to. Okay? It's, it's no more complicated than that. And I can describe a taxonomic concept, a species concept, and link it to a type specimen and then Rob can come in and describe another one and essentially be the same material, but they're equally valid. Okay? There's nothing wrong with either of them. They are both what your concept is. The, the two things that they have to have, uh, other than following the rules for how they're named, they have to be published. Okay? And by published, I mean they have to be published in... Um, in an available way in perpetuity, that doesn't mean they need to be reviewed. Although it's extremely difficult to get them adopted if they're not reviewed, but this idea that we have to have reviewed papers is, is not correct. There is a move towards that in the um, international, um, at the Congress, but it's not been adopted yet. There's also a move for registration, which means all your names won't actually be accepted until they're registered, which is what the fungi community do. So at the moment it's an anarchic free-for-all, um, but there's some moves to, to providing some constraints. Um, we all know, and one of the reasons this talk is happening, is because seagrass species concepts are difficult. And by that, they are they're difficult in that there's ambiguity around what you draw the lines around for the characters that you use to define what I think of as operational taxonomic units, which is how you can clearly separate things. Now, some of the arguments around this have been said to be because of the DNA work that started um, over the last 20 years, but that's in fact not the case. Um, these arguments date back as long as seagrass taxonomy has occurred and I remember the first time I met Ron Phillips at a conference in Victoria, Canada and, and he said, oh, you're Australian. Oh, those expletive Australians, they, they describe too many species. I don't want to talk to you. Um, so, so I was like, hang on, Ron. Um, so he, he was a great advocate for understanding the variability that you're looking at before taxonomy was applied. And so he, he's published a, a couple of things questioning some of the basis of, of various taxonomies. And there's nothing wrong with that as well. That's actually the process we should be going through. Someone describes a concept. We say, oh, this doesn't work for these reasons. We revise the concept and get a better outcome. So we have difficult groups. Now what's, what I think is remarkable is Cornelius Den Hartog's 
um, treatment in, that, that was published in 1970 is incredibly robust at the generic level. Okay? Even some of the families have moved around, but most of his genera are really, really well supported. And I was, I was thinking about why this was. And one of the reasons is that many of the, his diagnostic characters are actually reproductive characters. They're, um, they're, the, they're the, the, the things that he found that he could split at the genus level things. And I'm going to use Zostra as an example here. So the Zostraceae, really um, one of our um, really widespread and iconic groups, uh, particularly in temperate. Um, if we look at what the reproductive characters are in the Zostraceae, we've got Monoecious ver versus Dioecious, which give us Zostra, Heterozostra, and now Nanozostra, um, and Phyllospadix. But then we have Zostra, which at the moment there's three options for, and there's concern that's been raised about how that works. Now, one of the problems with those characters that have been proposed to separate Nanozostra and Heterozostra are they're vegetative characters. And they, are, they become problematic if we don't understand entirely the nature of their um, basis. Um, and that needs some discussion. Okay. I'm going to take you through an example now of how all of this has been... Um, so we've, we've been working on pretty much a whole range of tropical genera in particular, and, and no, a whole range of genera, um, to try and resolve the species concepts for them for some time. And I've been reluctant to do the taxonomic updates because my confidence in how clear the solutions are to the current questions has been poor. And I've taken the view that if I want to get rid of a species or a genus by thinking it and saying it's synonymous with something else, I want to be super confident that that's the right thing to do. So I don't want to change things until um, I, I can stand up in front of you guys and you know, lay on the ground and say, walk all over me, I think this is right. So some of them, my attitude hasn't changed at all over the last 18 years. But one of the groups that we've been working on is Hologely, or Halodouli, and I think it's a real problem because it exemplifies all of the issues that we've raised and it means we can't use any of the taxonomy we have right now. So. So that's just to freak you out. Um, I'll take you through the story. So distribution, there's a, there's a bunch of, um, I'm going I'm to refer to populations, a bunch of populations of Hologely that occur in the Caribbean, in the West, uh, tropical Atlantic-ish area down into Brazil, and I think it even gets down into Argentina, northern Argentina. Then we have the Indo-West Pacific, and there's a few records from uh, this makes it look like there's a lot more than there is, but there's a few records from the western coast of Africa. Um, in this region, as we heard on Monday night, there's, there's at least four species that have been described over, the, over time, but there's sort of been a settlement back towards the dominant view being that there's one species with a couple of forms that we don't know what to do with. Okay? In the Indo-West Pacific, we have the idea of, of two dominant species, Hologely uninervus and Hologely pinifolia, and with a recently described um, uh, trinervia, tridentata, tridentata, yes, of course. So they are thought to be, um, they've got, They've got similar characteristics and quite honestly, depending on where you are, um, you can work out what you've got. Um, but they vary in terms of, one of the main characters we use to tell them apart are these leaf tips. Okay? Now, I don't know how many leaf tips I've looked at in my career. I think probably about 10 million. Um, and they vary a lot. So if we look at the taxonomy, um, these Original concepts, 
date back to the 1880s, Sacherson. Um, Ossenfeld's work said um, it's, it's difficult to distinguish them um, at all. Um, Cornelius um, came up with some characteristics that he thought would work. So um, at this time he, re he um, suggested there were seven species in 1964. Our molecular data didn't support that. Our molecular data supports two species, one in each ocean, um, based on the traditional sequencing markers. Okay? So this is, um, these are moderately diversity generating but relatively conservative. How's that? And even less variation with the chloroplast markers. Um, basically, again, split, split across the oceans and no evidence, for example, that Hologely ritii occurs in Africa, by the way. So, what are the characters that Jen Hartog used? Um, his predominant character is the split to um, have this three-pointed leaf chip, and then that's how you pull out um, pinifolia, and then the rest have various other characters for that. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. You can't go straight to the end. You have at least another 20 minutes of torture. Okay, I'll go to there. Yep, I'm good. So, what's happening in the Indo-West Pacific and how do we work it out. Um, so our traditional sequencing showed the two groupings, basically take home message. What we've done now is we've generated genome wide screening markers for random um, anonymous markers. This is that's the data I'm going to show you and we're currently generating um, an AD gene region targeted data set. So, so this, is the, this is the first stage of the data I'm going to show you. Samples, um, in this data set are from the central part of the range, obviously different parts of Australia, um, from Malaysia and Thailand, some from Japan and some from the Philippines and Palau. So across a diverse range of locations um, and potential origins. One of the nice things about the kind of data that we've generated with these new types of markers is they're scattered across the whole genome. You can map them to genomic resources when you have them and you can get good replication um, of, of your history. And for example, if you get chloroplast data out, you can also map them to the chloroplast genome so you know what you're looking at. So, so you got more confidence that you're looking across the whole genome and Peter described this really nicely in his plenary the other day. So what were our results using a whole swag of these markers? Basically what we found was that there are three genetic lineages of Hologely. Okay, so the, wow, that's, we said there was three, right? We started with three, great. However, <laughs> just to, to make me get more grey hair, um, we also find between each of these groups, so one, two, three, we have hybrids forming. Okay? So we get the bits mating. So where do, where do these things occur? So if we look at, so this is a, in an ordinational space, we can see them separate out nicely. Similarly, if we do a phylogenetic analysis as opposed to a more population genetic analysis, you also see them split out nicely with the hybrids sitting transitionally in between them. So, okay, what does this mean? If we, and where are they from? So you can't read the text on here, but maybe these are all the ones in the north and these are the ones in the south and these are the ones in the west. Maybe, maybe it's geographic, wouldn't that be nice? Oh yes, but no. So. <laughs> So what do we got? We've got, yes, there's a bit of a signal, Western Australia's a bit more consistent, but throughout the rest of the sites, um, there's multiple lineages in each geographic region. 
Okay? And within each ge geographic region, they hybridise with each other, with the lineage that's there. Now, within each lineage, within geographic regions, we see a pattern of isolation by distance, although it's, it's weakish. I mean, given the scales that they occur on, they seem to, um, they seem to be making some sense over the larger scale. So, for example, from northeast Australia up into Japan, that's one of the lineages. Um, and the further you are apart, the more sequence divergence you have. So, it means that whatever's going on has time to accumulate mut mutations. Okay? Now, the next question is, how do these relate to the morphological characters that we might try to describe them? We've got pinifolia, we've got Unionervus and we've got tridentata. How does, how does that? So, unfortunately, um, when a lot of people collected material with us, we didn't have good samples for everything, but we've got enough that we can see a pattern. It's not what we, what we thought we might get. So, okay, lineage one tend to be narrow-leafed. So, this is, this is leaf width data, okay? They tend to be narrow-leafed, but I'll also caveat that by saying they were nearly all collected intertidally, so I have a concern about that as a character in itself, but, but this is the analysis. Um, lineage 2 is also mostly narrow-leafed. There's fewer of them, so um, they're tighter clustered. But lineage 3 has just about every leaf we, we could count. Okay? So lineage 3 was this group here, um, which seemed to be quite variable. Then lineage 4 here is hybrids between 1 and 2. And that makes sense. The, the leaf widths are a combination of those two lineages. That's, that's great. Um, but then lineage, the crosses between 1 and 3 and 1 and 4 also make sense. They're, um, they're sort of a mix of the predominant leaf width of the lineage that they're from. But what that means is, yes, they can... Um, uh, yes, yes, you can possibly tell them apart, but it means the hybrids also are reflecting the interaction of the two lineages. So what we're looking at is perhaps isolated populations that when they come together, they're mixing up again. So how do you explain this? So one of the big conundrums in the coral evolutionary biology literature that Charlie Varon used to talk about um, is this exact problem because Essentially, we see this in a few groups. Um, and what he summarised as the reticular evolution hypothesis is that by the lineages separating, diverg diversifying away from each other and then coming back together during periods of potential reconnection, what we're seeing are these mixing up and then separating and then mixing up of our lineages. And I believe that this is probably a good explanation for this. So if you think about a, a simple model of um, the difference between the continental margins today and this is about 20,000 years ago, but um, this is when the last um, sea level was, um, was lower, um, you can see that the places um, seagrasses might be surviving is quite different. And so you can imagine that things retreat to refugia and then come together. Um, one of the things I like to remember is the Great Barrier Reef is, is only five or 6,000 years old. So in the time scale of these plants surviving, there you know, are clonal individuals that can live hundreds or even maybe thousands of years. So, of course, you might have some of these problems occurring. So what we've got is genetic evidence for geographic co coherent lineages that have been isolated but then they're coming back together. They're largely morphologically cryptic, although there's some hint that there might be um, some characters that we could tease out. Um, but at the moment, um, I wouldn't be confident to say there's anything more than two species of phylogeny, one in the Caribbean tropical Atlantic and one in the Indo-West Pacific. 
but there may be cryptic lineages within them and that requires further work. So the taxonomic resolution would be two species and uh, there would be outside of the seagrass world, I don't think anyone would argue with me. So what does all this mean and how does this, this relate to other groups? We've got ongoing work um, looking at Posidonia where we have um, some pretty good evidence that um, uh, this group of five taxa are probably one um, and that Posidonia angustifolia is a hybrid of Sinuosa and Australis. Um, we have the really difficult group and I have to say um, Holophila as a whole group is actually pretty good at, um, but the ovalis complex is going to require a genuinely global piece of work to resolve um, so that we can get past um, the fact that we've got a whole bunch of species that um, have been described within this clade um, and uh, we've been doing a lot of work trying to resolve this but there's multiple lineages, they overlap geographically, they overlap morphologically, um, they are quite plastic for their morphological characters and it's, it's almost going to be impossible to resolve. Then we have groups like Thalassia which are really clear um, and you heard Cor talk a little bit about the, the Zostra conundrum in Australia um, and then we need a way forward. So what's our way forward? One of the problems with this is generating enough data. So at the species level, seagrasses generally have only moderate level of variation for traditional sequencing loci. I don't know how many, how many times we've sequenced a few new extra chloroplast genes or a few other genes to try and add to the data set to, um, to get more resolution and usually it doesn't help. So now, um, thanks to, to Core and a guy called Ed Biffin, who's, in one, who's my molecular bot botanist at the herbarium, we've been developing a hybrid bait catcher approach to generating um, large data sets that we can um, start to resolve these questions, not of chloroplast data, but of nuclear loci. The methods, I'm not going to spend any time going through this because it's quite technical and some of it's um, similar to what Peter talked about the other day but basically what we can do is we can avoid some of the problems of using PCR techniques um, and dealing with difficult DNA and there's companies out there that do some of this work um, and you get around some of the problems by attaching adapters, um, pulling them out using um, magnetic beads and um, then having the, only the sequences you want left in, um, in your mix and then being able to get the sequences and then using the bioinformatics line them up. Um, one of the really nice things about it is you can get it working on degraded DNA. So there's a bunch of studies now showing that we can um, dramatically increase the sequences we get as I've already shown you and we've, we've been screening this across a whole range of, of taxa in my lab um, and we can even get um, sequences out of very old herbarium specimens. So, so our oldest is 1890 but other people have got material working from older specimens and um, it becomes a bit, the, the preservation of material is critical so you do get failures where you get poor sequencing results but in general recently collected material works pretty well um, and, but you can have success with older material. So what does this mean in terms of taxonomy? Well, suddenly we've got doors that we can open. We've got, this is, um, this is a little uh, summary of the herbarium specimens available in Australian herbaria. Okay? We can do this because Angie is very tricky and did the database thing. Um, and um, for each genus, this is the number of specimens that are currently listed. Now the first thing I noticed was damn, there's not many specimens in our herbaria for seagrasses. Now my, my herbarium in Adelaide has probably some of the greatest numbers um, and, but this doesn't include lens collection um, that's go going in, gone in to Cairns um, yet um, but there's, there's a lot 
and, and taxonomy can't be done without herbarium specimens. I tell you this now. You have to vouch for things. So what does this mean? Well, the oldest specimen, nearly all of them date back to the 1800s. So what that means is we can look at what things were like a long time ago if you convince someone to let you sample it. And then we've got the other material all the way through to, to recently. So this is a great resource and it does mean we can cross-reference things with what's out there. My herbarium alone has over a million specimens in, not seagrasses, that's just, this is all of the collections. But um, one of the really important features is linking vouchers with reference databases. Okay? So one of the problems that we're having is we don't have good reference databases, which means if you say you want to be able to identify, um, I don't know, pick a random seagrass species, um, Holophila bayonis, you, what you need is a really good voucher that's lodged in a herbarium, which you also have a sequence for, and which is linked by these reference codes and field data. This is obviously for my herbarium with its Sturt Desert piece here. But um, we've got a specimen, field data, DNA sequences, high resolution images, and we're also starting to collect seed images and pollen library images. So this gives us so much more we can do. It also means the next generation of our, our researchers um, can go back and look at things and you can also update things. So the applications then become much more. You can take environmental samples like dugong poo or sediments and this is what my student Nicole Foster is doing with her sediment cores getting the DNA mix, sequencing them out and then being able to assign what species are there. And the reason we can do that is because we're going to generate the DNA sequence reference libraries that are linked to species with vouchers in herbaria collections and good taxonomy. So just to finish up, because someone will be telling me to get off in a second, um, one of the really important things of the work that we've been doing is that many species are distributed globally. Okay? Um, don't think that just because there's some kind of barrier between your populations of a species here and the nearest other populations that things may not be or have been connected. And species concepts probably, sorry, I need to phrase this very carefully, what might end up being recognisable species may in fact be found beyond the boundaries of where any one group would normally work. Okay? So we have to work together to get some resolution on this. So if you think you've got some great new species in your region, well it could just be an, uh, a disjunct population of a species that's found more widespread elsewhere and I think the um, Zostra or Heterozostra chilensis um, question is a, a good example of that, something that's way far away from everything else um, and it turns out that it's the same as an Australian species. So, so we need to be very thoughtful about what it is we're trying to compare and certainly the burden of proof for um, unnaming a species or sinking a species is so much higher than writing a new species description. It's, it's so much more work to prove something isn't something than it is to prove it is. So we have to be very aware of the fact that the flow and effect of our decisions about describing species um, are co have, have massive consequences. Species names are used in legislation. They're used for all of you to decide what your sampling unit is. And a really good example I think here is um, if you've got too many species described that are based around morphotypes of, uh, of genuine species, then you're going to only be looking at a subset of a population to do all your anal analyses of instead of the whole population. So some of the consequences of not understanding those relationships are quite significant. We all want to preserve our species. 
and I'm the first to want to recognise when there's genuine biodiversity in a place, but if we do it um, without recognition of the consequences and without understanding plasticity in particular of the characters we're choosing as diagnostic characters, then we'll have problems. Okay, thank you. Yes, Titi. Anyone? Yeah, here we go. Hey, Michelle, if we find that species that we already have seagulls here, can we just take them out of the location or whatever, searching up those seagulls for that, then we can use, like, the best species for So this is... Sorry. Yeah, this is a really good question. If, if, and I was going to bring it up at the IUCN workshop. Um, do we want a coordinated approach? Because I would be willing to do that. I've already started doing it within Australia, but if we want a coordinated approach, then perhaps through the World Seagrass Association we need like a, a, some kind of process where we set it up like that. And, and what my vision was, was once we'd um, got this suite of markers that could be run, any, any lab in the world could run them, um, or we could run it as a service, whichever was necessary, but it would um, be better if you could run them yourself. But in the end, you need a voucher at a herbarium. It doesn't have to be my herbarium, but you definitely need to have vouchers. And that's not always easy to do. I mean, most of you know how hard it is to add collecting a voucher, pressing a herbarium specimen to your work. It's not trivial, especially when you're in the middle of nowhere and you've got to <laughs> you know, dry things and stuff. But um, but it is really important to the, if you think it's got taxonomic value. And but routinely we try to make sure, in my group and the people that I work with, that every population has a reference voucher as well, just so that you can go back later, because occasionally you'll find something really weird. Like um, I was working on what I thought was Heterosostra nigricollis, but I'd sampled from the edge of a meadow in and it turns out at the edge of the meadow it was Zostra mulleri and as you went into the meadow it became Heterozostra. So, you know, looking at the meadow and looking at the plants, I would never have known that, but I knew when we sequenced it did we work it out. So, so there's all these things that can happen. If you don't have vouchers, you can't tell. Yeah. So just, I mean, I, I'm really, so I don't think we can vote on anything to do with taxonomy because it's actually not our role. <laughs> Um, I, I think we can advise that we're concerned about, say, the use of Nanozostra, but, um, but I think the taxonomic process has to roll out around nomenclature because that's actually a strict nomenclature question. The actual definition of the group hasn't changed. It's just a name. So, so someone asked the other night, does it matter? Well, yes or no. Um, no, not really. So do we, do we want to have some kind of coordinated taxonomy working group or something? Is that a question? It's a question. Yes. Three years. Three years. <laughs> yeah, OK. Well, I'll, um, I'll bring it up at the w, WSA tonight then. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Michelle.